So with the technical indicators, we classify them three ways into sort of a trend following category or momentum. We also consider them to be gauges of overbought and oversold readings and then relative strength. So what we always tell folks that are uh, sort of just trying to build their um, strategy or their methodology is to not have too many indicators that are trying to deliver that same message. Too many momentum gauges, too many overbought, oversold measures, et cetera. So we have two or three, but, but it's our day job, so we're allowed to have that many. <laughs> um, you can simplify and really just have one or two. Um, you know, the, the outcome is that you wanna stay on the right side of the market. Um, we don't try to be ultra predictive in our research. Uh, you know, we certainly have biases. Uh, but where I think we can add value on the risk management front is to identify prevailing trends over different time horizons. And we can do that through the use of these trend following gauges. Moving averages are pretty straightforward. We want to see a directional bias from these moving averages over uh, various time frames. The MACD indicator, moving average convergence, divergence, I think we probably all know that indicator in this room. And it is, to me, one of the best gauges of the trend. Um, and, and I love it because it gives you that sort of binary buy sell takeaway with its crossovers. The cloud model may be a little bit more obscure, but also uh, really incredibly value add in terms of the visualization of support and resistance, but also the identification of the primary trend. And you'll see how important it is right at this moment for the major indices. For our overbought, oversold measures, we're primarily using the stochastic oscillator and also the DeMarc indicator. So I know Tom DeMarc is being honored tomorrow by this organization with the annual award. So very well deserved. And for relative strength, comparative ratios, we're taking just price to price ratios and typically we're applying it on the sector front. I see some folks in that, this room that I know also are practicing this um, you know, with, with some depth to it. I think these ratios are almost like the lowest hanging fruit from the market if you're focused on US equities, where you can find sources of outperformance and underperformance and express those views now in a very easy way through sector uh, ETFs or what have you. And then I don't know if Julius is in the room, but uh, Julius de Kempenar's relative rotation graphs, so we call them RRGs, which I love. Um, but by the way, so this is the year to date. Um, or no, the 2022 sector returns, I mean, wow, right? Energy up more than 50% last year, and then the worst performing sector down 41%. So you see that spread, and that is not a totally abnormal spread. Abnormal, perhaps, that energy you know, is such a, uh, the only one in the green. But in terms of that big spread, this is where you can find some real value in the marketplace. For the market internals, we look at them in terms of breadth, sentiment, leadership, and volume. And what we uh, sort of were humbled by in 2008, it's, it's the extremes became more extreme from the market internal measures. So we felt, you know, the put call ratios or, or something of that nature, they kind of like stayed at higher levels and got even higher. <laughs> and we said, well, gosh, that, that really um, is dangerous. We felt like we um, couldn't rely on the same gauges that had informed us before. So we adapted by, I guess, diversifying the way we were looking at market internal measures. So we took, instead of like one or two, we took a whole collection and host of these different market internal measures representing all of those four factors. And we present them in aggregate in sort of a, a table in our daily research. And in that table, we'll highlight when we're seeing extremes. So when any of the measures are at historical extremes on the buy or the sell side or overbought, oversold uh, sort of perspective.